Hey, everyone. Before we get to today's episode of Perpetual Chess, I just wanted to say thanks to everyone who has supported the show. Ways to support Perpetual Chess include telling a friend about the show, subscribing on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you use, better yet, leaving a positive review on that platform. But most of all, I want to thank the people who've supported me with the new Patreon page. If you haven't heard, it's patreon.com slash perpetual chess. And the suggested donation there is $2 a month. So I tried to keep it as affordable as possible for as many people as possible. The donations go to cover things like the production, the audio equipment, and the hosting for the show. So if you can't afford it, you definitely shouldn't donate. But if you can, it's really appreciated and it helps out a lot. And guess what? I think it's also going to make the show better. What we're going to do is people who donate to the show will get advance notice of the guests and they will have the chance to send in questions to the guests. So if you feel like there's some topic I don't cover enough, or if you have some favorite player that you're waiting for them to come on, well, there's a good chance we're going to get them at some point. So now you can sit back and wait. And then when someone's coming on who interests you, you can pounce like a cheetah and get your questions in. I think this is going to make it a better show overall, more community driven. I've always said I want this show to be by the people and for the people. Well, I think that this will help make that happen. So thanks again for all the support and enjoy today's episode. Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with the chess world's best players, promoters, and educators about their lives, careers, current projects, and best practices. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Perpetual Chess. We are here with international master, uh, writer, chartered accountant, Sagar Shah. Sagar, thank you for joining us all the way from Mumbai to Pittsburgh. Thank you, Ben, for having me. Uh, usually, I'm on the other side of an interview. It's good to be interviewed, I guess. First time, yeah? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, you'll have to let me know how I do interviewing you. <laughs> sure. But uh, but uh, we're really happy to have you on. Um, this podcast has been going for about nine months now, and we like to get a global perspective on the chess world. And you can't have a global perspective without talking about the chess hotbed that is India. Yeah, for sure. I mean... Uh Maybe the next superpower, yes. Yeah, it sure seems like it. And in addition to that, you also, in your work for Chess Base India, get to travel to a lot of tournaments. So I feel like you're in a great position to give perspective on a lot of things. And I know we, we've been in touch for a while uh, trying to coordinate, but you're so busy going to these, um, these, these top-level competitions that it took us a while to get it together. So why don't you start, Sagar? You just got back a little while ago from Isle of Man and World Cup, so why don't you tell us a little bit about what your impressions was of these tournaments that the rest of us have been following online? Yeah, I mean, I, I went to the World Cup only. I, I couldn't make it to the Isle of Man oh, because I, I stayed right until the very end of the World Cup, so it kind of clashed with each other. Uh, but but I followed both the events very closely. Uh, in, I mean, at the World Cup, I was there in person, but Isle of Man, uh, I followed online. <clears throat> so, uh, I think World Cup uh, for me was an, an amazing experience uh, because as a reporter, uh, I could get in touch with almost all the top players, right from Magnus Carlsen to Anand, Karyakin, Aronian, um, you name it, yeah, and uh, I could get an insight into how these great players think, play, and stuff. So it was very nice uh, experience for me and my wife Amruta. Uh, we both travel together. She's uh, she's the photographer, and I write. So so that was very nice. So what sort of you get to see these guys up close and see how they approach these these events that. Uh, seem so so nerve wracking to someone like me. So, what do you learn from such an up close view? I think uh, the main thing that I get to learn when I see these players play is uh, just that sometimes my emotions are completely different from theirs. You know, I try to put myself in in shoes of these top players. For example, let's say Aronian uh, when he was playing the finals. I was trying to put myself in uh, in his shoes and uh, the thing was that in, in four games that he played with Ding Liren, the classical games, uh, in two of them he had winning positions. 
and uh, he missed both of them and i felt like the he should be upset about it and the tide should be with the chinese player uh, however when i when i interviewed him at the end when he won the world cup he said that actually when he got an advantage in in both the games like game 2 and game 4 uh, he he felt that uh, even though he missed the win it was the tournament was going his way entirely and it was all about keeping the momentum and the enthusiasm and he would get a breakthrough pretty soon somehow i think that the the mental toughness and confidence level of these top players is entirely at a different level and uh, this is what i think uh, i learn a lot from them that they never really uh, give up and uh, i think that these are the qualities which we keep discussing all the times and in we read them in articles and books but actually to see them in real action uh, uh, helps me a lot interesting and i know sagar that you're a strong chess player yourself um an international master with a with a couple norms uh, to get the gm title to boot so yes. when when you pick up insights like this um how how can it change your your approach i mean i'm sure you don't get to play as much as you would like but uh how how would you like try to try to change how you play based on insights like that yeah i think nowadays i cannot devote much time to playing because of my work but uh, whenever i uh, am at such tournaments i keep learning from from such incidents and uh, few of the things which i learn from such events is like for example a player like bu ziangzi beating magnus carlsen or kovalyo uh, beating vishy anand and these things when you are at home and you look at them is much different from being there actually and seeing these players uh, when when bu ziangzi was actually winning against magnus carlsen in the first game of their um, of their mini match uh, i was there right like 10 meters away and i was trying to look at the expression of the chinese player and uh, because for him to beat the world champion is not an everyday thing and somehow it seemed like uh, just another day for him you know he was he was making his moves at the end so confidently and and we actually recorded a a, a video which uh, got a lot of hits on on chess base india youtube channel uh, about this and and somehow uh, noticing these things uh, helps me a lot when i sit at the board uh, and when i play against players like i i uh, i played uh, three events before the world cup uh, which were uh, decently strong events and and i could gain rating in uh, each of them uh, and also beat uh, some strong players I, i i don't know if <laughs> if this is because of uh, such events but at the back of the mind you are always learning something yeah and i noticed that i mean you're you're following the action in the games and you seem pretty well versed in in some of the openings that get played so i'm sure that doesn't hurt your chess either yeah i think uh, some people call me uh, the op- some kind of an opening expert uh, i don't know i think my main ad- uh, strength is that i can assimilate knowledge very quickly uh, so if there it's an opening i can quickly look at all sorts of games which have been played and if it's a novelty why did he play this what was played earlier uh, so in this sense uh, i think i have pretty good knowledge for a player who is rated 2400 uh, i would say my my opening knowledge is much better than my rating well that's a great strength to have both as a chess player and as a chess reporter Um I I I enjoyed the video you did breaking down uh a novelty and I think it was the the Catalan um or it may have been the Ready one yeah. uh Yeah Wesley Sow's novelty uh, sorry Ding Liren's novelty against Wesley Sow uh, yes. 91 Yeah <clears throat> and and speaking of Ding Liren you also you I mean he made quite a name obviously we know who he is anyway but he really raised his profile with this performance at the World Cup and I I enjoyed the fact that you were able to get a little sit down with him and get to know a little bit behind the uh get to li- know the person a little bit because uh we we follow his game so closely yes uh, i think the somehow interviewing these new players like ding liren or uh, let's say wesley so i mean new in the sense young guys it is much more uh, easier as a reporter than a, you say interviewing a person like uh, anand or uh, kramnik 
or Ivan Chuk because uh, it's just that these these young guys have so much freshness and uh, it's it's uh, new for them while for for the other people like say anand this has happened so many times in their life that they tend to get a little um <laughs> I, i wouldn't say irritated but it's it's something that has happened before with them so for ding liren i think uh, this was the first time when uh, i uh, he was actually uh, playing at such a high level and uh, at the world cup finals i mean he was the first chinese player to qualify to the candidates uh, he is and uh, to reach the finals so i think he was enjoying himself uh, earlier i thought he would be some kind of uh, an introvert he wouldn't speak much about uh, himself but when i started interviewing him after the quarter finals he would he would say all sorts of things like uh, when uh, when a question is asked to a player what would he do on a rest day the usual answer is i i have not planned it or something but ding liren actually said i'm going to wash clothes hmm. and uh, <laughs> that's when i i realized that uh, he he likes to share stuff and he likes to uh, he wants people to know more about him and and uh, i think uh, i was able to get uh, a lot of uh, information out uh, on him yeah way. and it was appreciated because um as you know china in particular i feel like the the players don't don't necessarily get as much attention and i know from you know from my perspective i uh, i do this podcast from my attic in pittsburgh so I have some connections and try to reach out to people any way I can and people in places like China and to a slightly lesser extent India are are harder to 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 reach so it's on the one hand they get less attention to begin with but on the other they're just they're just harder to access Yes uh, but uh, I think maybe uh, it it's going to change soon and for example when uh, all the people all the Chinese people I too had the similar opinion that uh, it's very difficult to talk to them first of all because of the language barrier uh, but let's say Wang Hao, Bu Ziangzi, uh, Ding Liren at least these three people I I spoke to uh, they were so so easy to talk to and they really wanted to uh, the world to know about them so i think uh, maybe your next podcast should be with some chinese player oh that would be that would be awesome <laughs> yeah i would love to love to do that the my two i have a few white whales that i chase on this podcast you know either it can be a person that i want to get which i obviously i'm not going to say who it is until i get them or like but certain uh demographics and parts of the world too and now that i've had you from from india uh i mean i'm still going to want many other indian players eventually but yeah china is now the one remaining and and an african player would be good too so but yeah. definitely want to represent the entire world and get a slice of uh what chess is like everywhere yeah, this is something very nice that you are doing and and i truly appreciate the work that you are doing it's oh. really amazing well likewise you're writing i mean it spans uh You know, first of all just covering the events is great, but also um more so maybe than some other chess chess reporting. I feel like I I learn about chess when I read your writing. Um partially because I think you're you know, you're such a strong player yourself, so it it's helpful for for me. Uh well, when I'm writing a report, uh, no matter what like before we started speaking right now, I just finished a report on a uh, uh, 11 year old boy winning uh, his maiden I am norm in in Malaysia, uh, an Indian player. And uh, I I can I start off with uh, an aim to report the minimal stuff, you know, I I start off with some pictures and that he won. but when i see his game and when i see the beautiful uh, moves that he has made uh, the reporter within me or you can say the journalist within me uh, cannot just uh, leave it alone like a, a bland article because i think it would be injustice to the person who has worked so hard uh, while playing and uh, so whenever i write uh, i let's say 90% of the times i try to put in some special effort into it and uh, Yeah that's that's why I think uh, people do enjoy what I write to to some extent. Yeah, it definitely shows. And okay, since you mentioned one of the many young talents in India, let's talk about uh, uh let's talk about the the chess scene there. So of course the main question we want the answer to is what's the secret? <laughs> why why are there so many strong Indian players getting ready to to take over the chess world? 
I, I think first of all, chess is much more serious uh, in India than what it is uh, in Europe. Uh, I, I have traveled to let's say 25 countries in, in Europe in the last three years with, uh, with Amruta. Uh, and uh, I realized that somehow at some events when we would play, it's much more uh, relaxed. People are, um, you know, having a nice time, they're gathering and stuff. But when you play in India, uh, it's always like pin drop silence before the round. People are serious. The young kids, you know, they're praying to, to God before the game. I mean, not just uh, that. It's like chess is taken very seriously. And uh, it's it's the way that uh, they are brought up. I would say each and every kid... Uh, who is talented right now is is taking it very seriously and uh, it's partly because uh, the parents see the scope in it uh, first of all because of Vishy Anand uh, I mean without him chess in India would have never reached what it is right now uh, the, you have a role model to look up to you know what, what is possible uh, in five time world champion so uh, I think he was the main reason. Mm, secondly, I think the the National Association of India is is doing a pretty decent job. Uh, they have regularized uh, everything uh, in in terms of state tournaments, national events. So it 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 happens uh, in each of uh, Indian states. There are these events that take place every year, and then there are nationals happening, and and uh, I think. There are very good coaches as well in India. The the main one being uh, Ramesh, and and uh, once you have guys like Pragnananda and Nihal, these two two geniuses, I would say. I, I mean, uh, really, India is lucky to have these two kids. Uh, then other kids who are let's say seven, eight, or even nine, they start uh, looking up to them rather than you know having to look at someone like Anand who is is far off right now. They, they can actually feel that uh, they can achieve something like this. So uh, it's now what is happening is it's just rolling one after the other. I mean, you can see a new talent coming up every few months in, in India. Okay. So there's a lot I want to uh, drill down on from that. But I'll start. So I do a feature here where we have some guest questions, and there's one that's sort of related to that. So I mean, not to guest questions, sorry, like uh, supporters of the podcast send in questions for the guests. So uh-huh. I'm, I'm going to read you a question, and then uh, we'll take it from there. So this is from Ashish Mukarji, uh, who is a big fan of yours and had a few questions. So here's one of them. Um, I remember the days when ONGC, Indian Railways, and other big firms used to award sinecures uh, to top hockey and cricket players. Do chess players in India receive similar benefits today, or are they mostly self-funded through prize money coaching and other direct earnings? No, they are funded, and uh, I would say almost uh, 80% of the grandmasters in India are employed with uh, a government company. Uh, so it it could be uh, railways or ONGC and stuff. So in a way, uh, if you are a strong chess player in India, you can say that you can make a decent living out of it uh, just by being a grandmaster. You get employed by ONGC or uh, uh, let's say uh, IOC, Indian Oil or BPCL and all these, there are many companies like these. And then they pay you a, a, a specific sum uh, per month. Mm, it could be something from, say, uh, $1,000 to $2,000, something like this amount. And then uh, you don't have to actually go and work most of the times. So it's uh, it's actually not bad. Yeah, that that could be a huge, a huge competitive advantage compared to um, other places. Yes, I think so. But uh, also... Uh, Things are becoming a little bit uh, dangerous because the rate at which uh, we are gaining grandmasters, uh, it might soon be that there might not be enough spots left in these uh, companies. So like last uh, one and a half years, we already have 10 GMs in India, which is uh, quite a (laughs) good number. 10 new ones? Yeah, 10 new ones since uh, 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 2006, sorry, uh, 2016. Nice. Well, hopefully they continue to see the value of of, uh, of supporting chess. Uh, so the money you said it comes from government funded companies. So um, if you could enlighten this uh, ignorant American, so these are basically. Uh, hey, you there? Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, 
these are so these these are companies who are state owned yes uh, they they are government companies and usually they have a quota which is known as a sports quota and they have to employ a few people uh, it could be from any sport like badminton cricket uh, football table tennis and and chess as well so uh, <clears throat> i mean if if i if i would like to get uh, into say a company like railways uh, i think it's possible even for an im to get get into it uh you you start off with a small salary and then as you keep performing better it keeps improving so uh in a way uh yes you you, you can uh, earn money based on your chess skills in india okay and you just using you as an example because it se- strikes me that you're probably a good example because you're sort of on the cusp you know you're 2400 feet a and you have two gm norms so mm-hmm. if you if you got the third norm uh, and met the requirements for Grandmaster, would that be like an immediate change in your lifestyle? For me, uh, not uh, specifically because uh, I have uh, made my lifestyle in a way that uh, is not dependent on my title right now uh, because I started Chess Base India uh, and uh, also working as a journalist. It doesn't... Uh, change things drastically or dramatically because I'm not looking out for a job uh, in these companies nor am I looking out for training people. If, if I was a coach, I think becoming a GM would definitely make a difference. Um, so so as such, if I want to become a GM, it would be for my personal uh, satisfaction and uh, just as a challenge for myself rather than uh, to make my to make a huge change in my lifestyle. Okay, and if you did get the title, it would, it wouldn't be like then you're automatically enrolled. You would, you would probably need to to quit some of your work, uh, and uh, be hired by one of these companies as as a chess player. Yes, I I wouldn't. Uh, I mean, uh, I wouldn't do that. Even I, I, I'm sure about it. I think, but uh, if. If I do want to get employed at this company, I have to ensure that I'm not employed anywhere else. You know, you can't uh, uh, have multiple earning uh, resources if you if you are like, for example, GMs who are employed with the oil company cannot uh, start their own uh, ventures or companies because they are employed here and they should be playing chess and uh, doing that. Okay, and what about the talented young kids? Uh, what do they receive support as well? I think uh, there are scholarships that are given by these uh, companies. They they don't get jobs, so it's not a uh, huge sum of money, but they do get some scholarships. And uh, recently, uh, this young guy Nihal Sarin was sponsored by um, Tata, which is. Uh, which is a big company in India. Also, you have the Tata Steel right. uh, tournament. So, uh, I think money is uh, is slowly f- uh, flowing in in terms of uh, corporate sponsorship. Uh, I, I see Adiban or uh, Hari Krishna coming to these tournaments in World Cup and wearing not just one logo of ONGC or or the company which they represent, but also of another one, Microsense. So. So people are getting uh, multiple uh, mm, sponsorships. For so for young kids, I would say uh, these two kids definitely have some support for now because they are they are the big names. But uh, the other ones are also they they do uh, do get some something from uh, some companies. But uh, it's it's not as easy as. Uh, uh, it seems. Yeah. Okay. And what about the actual chess training? Like, do you think there's anything special in terms of like the way that these talented kids are being taught? Um, how are they? Like, is the interest? Does the interest start from the family? And uh, how does the train? Like, how do they find their trainers and stuff like that? I think it's very haphazard in India. I mean, it's not structured. Uh, you see, I, if if I have interviewed any talent, it would be something like. My son was watching TV and I didn't want him to waste time or my daughter was watching this and uh, she was wasting too much time in her day. Uh, so I, we thought, why not 
make her do something useful or oh, chess is great game because it keeps the child calm and so it always uh, is like a serendipity yeah? they start off uh, with something uh, just for fun and suddenly it starts becoming very serious with all these talents um but once uh, I, I i don't think indian chess circuit is very structured in that way uh, for young kids training or such but we do have good coaches and academies uh, everywhere um and so i think uh, yeah these kids uh, they keep improving uh, all the time by by playing tournaments for example uh, we have one guy in mumbai who who is uh, let's say very good he is around 10 years old rated 2000 and then he goes to a tournament where he meets uh, say uh, nihal's parents or pragnananda's parents or even for that matter ronak sadwani and and these are all 2300 plus uh, players who are rated 10 or 11 uh, who are aged 12 or uh, 10 or 11 and then these parents interact with each other they share uh, a few things and and i think that that's uh, the way people are improving it's not uh, like um, everything is laid down perfectly uh, and and you know what is to be done okay so related question also from a ashish um is there an indian style of chess in the 21st century or are there perhaps regional styles bengali versus tamil versus delhi how would you describe these styles if they exist and how did they develop i don't think so i i i see uh, don't see a specific style as such for example uh, in, i mean in general i would say south in chennai is is the hub of chess in india uh because of anand being there um and and i could say that okay south players from chennai are aggressive uh because you can say adiban is aggressive seturaman is aggressive but then you suddenly have a player like let's say sasikiran or uh, say hari krishna from the uh hyderabad and and these players are positional so i wouldn't say that uh, there is a specific style attached to any region in india uh it's just uh, i would say random i mean it, it depends on whom you are learning chess from and uh, what sort of lifestyle you live in and all this matters a lot okay um yeah that would have been my guess but it, it is interesting to think about um okay so a somewhat related question um i in addition to reading your work on chess base i'm i follow you on on facebook and a few months ago i know the the uh you and india were visited by the um the very respected trainer yakub agard and you had a lot of uh funny pictures of like i mean both funny and insightful of uh of you guys sort of touring india it seemed and uh giving um you know he he would give lectures and work with people and dance and i don't know what else so could could you describe that trip a little bit for our listeners yeah i i uh for me yakob was some sort of a, a person from whom i learned so much in chess i read his books i saw his dvd uh, chess based dvd which was uh, basic positional ideas and i i always liked his uh, easy style of teaching chess and uh, slowly and steadily uh, as i started um, gaining in strength and uh, also uh, doing more work related to journalism i think we we connected uh, with each other and spoke online and then uh, he said once that he would like to visit india and asia <clears throat> and do his book tour for his final uh, book which is thinking inside the box and uh, i don't know at, at that point we had already started chess base india and uh, I I thought Jakob fo- found that um, I would be the right person to uh, help him in this regard and uh, we had no no real experience of what is to be done but uh, of course being a chess player for so many years I had friends uh, in all parts of India so we organized these uh, training sessions which were into two parts uh, one was where he would train uh, talented players or strong players and the second one would be an open session where he, where uh, everyone was invited including parents so at each place we would have these two sessions and we traveled from mumbai which is in uh, center of i mean western part of india to 
Delhi in north, uh, Kolkata in east, uh, Chennai in south, and also Ahmedabad. So these five cities we we covered, and uh, it was uh, it was really uh, great to see uh, him teaching first of all. And I realized that uh, some of the concepts which uh, he would say uh, were not too deep. But uh, as with any good concept, it has to be simple. And once he says it, it looks very simple. But for him to arrive at it, took a lot of time. And uh, th the one which I like the most uh, was uh, slowing down. And uh, he would always say that when you start calculating any position, it's important to slow down. And it sounds so simple because uh, when you are when you are calculating. Uh, you tend to miss stuff because you're going too fast in a line. If you slow down at the right moment, you might get the right move. But uh, when we are doing this during the game, we are so not aware of it that actually in this camp, I would say he used this term slowing down maybe more than 100 times. Uh, you know, he, he just kept using it. And uh, I, I, I personally learned a lot. And when I played a tournament after that, uh, it, I mean, it was very bad because I played in Indonesia and lost. But I always kept this in mind, and it helped me later in the recent tournaments where I was able to do well. Huh, that's interesting and and probably helpful uh, for a lot of people who are trying to um, trying to get better themselves. So, uh, when you got a chance to observe the the workshops that he was doing, what sort of material would would he present there? I think uh, what separates a good trainer from other apart from chess skills is uh, having very good organizational skills. For example, uh, Jakob, whenever he saw something interesting, he would uh, put it into one of his uh, folders which would have say tactics or uh, positional play or end game and you know he had all these different uh, buckets in which he could put a position into and no material was actually wasted for example uh, once I just showed him a position or, or uh, it was like we were in Chennai and uh, we, he entered the room um, where uh, Young, uh, I mean, these uh, top players, young guy, Diptayan Ghosh, uh, Surya Shekhar Ganguly and all were analyzing a position. And uh, Jakob just had a look at this position and they were analyzing because uh, the session had not started. So he went there and, you know, uh, also joined in for a few minutes and then the session started and uh, it all went on. Uh, next day he comes to the session and uh, sets up the position on the board and says you, do you know that over here white was winning and then he shows all the analysis on which he had worked uh, at night wow. so I would say uh, uh, being a good trainer like Jakob requires a few things one is that you need to uh, constantly be on the alert that there could be some training material everywhere and anywhere you know and you should pick it up secondly you should have this uh, great love for chess that after a tough training day you would want to take rest and go to sleep but rather he uh, he, he goes and analyzes these uh, positions and uh, so i think these and, and also you should be able to organize your stuff well because i think by now he has such a huge database of positions that he could go just about anywhere and teach without even having to prepare because he has done this for so many years. Wow, that's uh, that's really insightful. That's interesting. Um, so, um, anything else stand out from that trip? Um, I mean, you guys went a bunch of places. Was uh, was organizing it a challenge? Uh, I think first of all, in in, in India. Uh, the, the one thing which was really nice was in Chennai uh, because we did the camp at uh, Ramesh's academy uh, and I would say uh, Jakob has great respect for Ramesh and just like all um, uh, I mean all the Indians and a lot of people who know Ramesh uh, he is actually just phenomenal he works say 14 to 15 hours a day training kids right from beginners to players like Pragnananda or Arvind Chidambaram and people like this. So we, we held the camp in his training academy and uh, <clears throat> and the funny part was that uh, there were around 15 students there 
and uh, the lowest rated was around uh, 2400 uh, so something like an uh, amazing strength was witnessed there and then there Jakob uh, really found, uh, found it very easy to teach because he, whatever he wanted to say was just absorbed by everyone like instantly but uh, the thing which I really remember from there is uh, Ramesh himself you know uh, he cancelled all his trainings uh, and he sat in the class uh, learning from Jakob and uh, a trainer like him who has been a uh, multiple time coach of Indian national team has helped India get uh, its first uh, Olympiad medal uh, for him to sit there and actually learn from whatever so this this shows that he was keen on uh, enhancing his knowledge from whatever uh, Jakob was teaching so this was one great incident that I, I remember uh, from Chennai Mm. One more thing which I would like to add is the open session which took place in the same city just to tell you uh, why Chennai is considered to be the chess capital of India uh, was that uh, in a hall there were around 300 people who came to, to listen to Jakob. It was a jam-packed hall. I think it could take only 250 so there was already crowd uh, gathering and once the session ended the way they they attacked him sort of for his autographs and <laughs> photographs it seemed like he was a rock star there and uh, and when when Jakob was getting down and uh, exiting at that point uh, one uh, young kid shouted uh, uh, you are my role model uh, uh, and, uh, and Jakob, Jakob said this made my trip already you know this is something uh, so so this shows that chess is actually not just uh, uh, a game or something it's it's taken very seriously in india wow that's an amazing story i mean the mere fact that 250 to 300 people showed up is, is impressive and uh yes to be treated with such reverence i'm sure was uh was very gratifying um and uh, you know i think uh part of it getting back to what you said about state uh, about the state company supporting the players i'm sure that 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 trickles down like i'm sure that that uh even the young players, like the fact that there's sort of a st- sustainable path for chess players, that there's a um, that there's a sort of a carrot being dangled at the end of the road. I'm sure that it just motivates people so much more, um, and and gives them um, uh, will to work even harder and appreciate chess even more. I, I I would like to think of it this way: that people who are young kids who are working are so self motivated. That actually they are, the, I don't think they are very concerned about these things. Uh, at least the young, uh, the very young current crop uh, who, who are uh, there. I, I don't think they even think about these things. Of course, uh, they are too young to think this. Um, but I, I have a feeling that people uh, start worrying uh, about, uh, I mean, parents start worrying about their kids at an age around, say, 16 or something. Uh, whether they whether they could make a sustainable life out, out of chess and by that time most of them know whether it's possible or not uh, so yeah i mean having these this state support is is, uh, is actually great uh, i would say um, but uh, i think most of the people are just self motivated uh, it's not something that uh, if this didn't exist uh, well maybe if this didn't exist it would have surely made a difference but uh, right they're not thinking about that. I think. Yeah, I, I see what you mean. I guess uh, what I'm getting at is it, it – my guess, obviously you could speak better to it than I can, is that uh, chess – it sounds like chess sort of permeates the culture in India in a way that maybe it doesn't in other places. And I think that the, the fact that it's so respected um, – there and that their support and that you had you know legendary chess player Anand there I think all of that sort of contributes to it so it might not be like an explicit thought process especially for a young kid but I think that um, it still might contribute to uh, extra motivation and uh, extra spirit to work at chess yes I think so and also uh I see people taking bold decisions now like pulling their kids out of school for a year or two just to focus on chess. Uh, Earlier it was more like you should give more uh, stress to your education but but now it's uh, becoming much better uh, everywhere that people 
Uh, yeah, uh, this is the main problem still that when it comes to a crucial juncture, many people do choose education over over their uh, play. And uh, of course, we're, one of the biggest examples is Parimarjan Negi in India, who is currently in Stanford and studying in spite of having a rating of uh, 2670. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I think a lot of schools are also supporting the kids by saying that okay just go and play as much as you can and uh, you know we can have the exams or something later on so i i whenever i have interviewed these young kids they always say my school supports me a lot uh, and so once the school is supporting you and you don't have problems there then i i don't see why young kids should worry about anything else yeah it makes sense um, okay, Saga, I want to switch gears a little bit because you, you've you mentioned Chess Base India. We both have a few times. Um, so, And you, you as one of the co-founders of it, I was curious about sort of the, the origin of like how you came to, um, to have the idea and to bring it into existence. I think, uh, first of all, uh, what I always wanted to do was... Uh, make some difference in Indian chess, I mean in general the chess world and uh, it had to start somewhere and when at one at a few tournaments when I would speak with Indian P players uh, they would always say that um, you know chess based software uh, is so so critical for us uh, for uh, for all chess players but it's so expensive and, and it's true I mean if you check chess base 14 100 euros might be uh, okay for for Europeans but for Indians it's like uh, many people have their monthly salaries as as uh, 100 euros you know uh, so so having uh, such expensive softwares was actually not uh, easy uh, for Indian players to buy and as you know you being a, a good chess player yourself without chess base it, it's not possible to uh, to work well on chess so we uh, I decided that I would uh, I was in, I was in the best possible position because uh, I wrote for chess base uh, since 2014 and so it was already a year and I had uh, very good relations with uh, co-founder of chess base uh, Frederick Friedel uh, who, who is uh, who I look up to with great respect and uh, I, I suggested him this and, and then uh, he, he liked it. We spoke with the CEO of Chessbase who also thought it was a good idea. I mean, uh, in general, for a company to reduce its prices by 60% uh, is, is really a bold decision. And I, I really thank Chessbase for, for doing that because, first of all, by, by bringing these softwares at a cheaper cost in India, it helps uh, chess players to gain these softwares at, at a reduced cost but also uh, because we have a sustainable business model now uh, it helps to have a very thriving news page uh, which is uh, chessbase.in the website and I, I think uh, it has made a tremendous difference when let's say a young lad performs well and sees himself there right at the top on a, on a news page uh, where, uh, where uh, he's discussed and people are talking about his playing style this motivates him greatly so so there are two things to chess base india one is the softwares being uh, available at uh, at a very um, affordable price and the other thing is the news page which so these two are working really well for indian chess yeah, it sounds great. I actually wasn't aware of the reduced price. That's that's awesome that they're able to accommodate, uh, you know, cheaper standard of living um, and help yes. support chess in that way. Well, I mean, it has extended not just, uh, I mean, not in India, but uh, to eight other countries, which includes uh, uh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bangladesh, Philippines, Thailand, uh, Malaysia, and also Georgia now. So I think uh, these these prices are, uh, let's say, chess base 14 would cost something like 40 euros uh, over here, all these places, and uh, it really helps, I would say. Okay. Um, and in terms of uh, the website, uh, sometimes when I like when I read your stuff, I think it's under the Chess Base India banner, but is there also uh, stuff that's only presented locally and in, different, in uh, the local languages? We started Chess Base India Hindi page. 
uh, Niklesh, uh, my friend, uh, is the editor in chief of Hindi, and uh, this is this uh, step has been appreciated by a lot of people because Hindi is one of the official languages of India, and uh, <coughs> people who who know Hindi but not English. Uh, unfortunately, chess news is not so easy for them to grasp. So we started the Hindi news page, and uh, India has so many languages. So maybe in the near future, we would have a Tamil uh, news page, uh, a Kannada news page, or let's say even a Bengali news page. Wow, it's that happened. that would be great. And are you covering like more chess? I mean, obviously you're going to the big events and covering those, but is chess covered sort of on? Uh, a more local scale like on the uh, Hindi page? No, I think on the English as well. I mean, both uh, if, in, on Chess Base India, if you... When I went to these tournaments, uh, which were World Cup and also before that candidates, I would mostly cover it for chessbase.com, uh, which is the international news website. Uh, on Chess Base India, I would cover the Indian players playing there like in world cup there were seven indians who, who were there so it would be more india centric uh now that we you know i would say we have learned a lot by being at these top tournaments by seeing some top reporters uh by by being in constant touch with top players even receiving feedback from top players who read our website so what Amruta and I have come up with uh, is kind of a wacky plan uh, and which we are going to set into motion after uh, I think a month and a half uh, from 1st of December is to actually uh, not have a base uh, which is a home and to start traveling throughout India, uh, predominantly India. We would like to go outside India as well but mainly India and to go from one tournament to another not coming back home ever because we don't have one and uh, to to co- cover uh, chess events at the same level at what we cover other uh, these grand international events uh, the main idea being that this would boost chess tremendously in the country wow that that sounds like quite an undertaking <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, it sounds scary at first, but I think as a chess player, uh, we are the most ideal people to undertake this. I mean, we, we can travel, we can do our job traveling and uh, nothing better than that, right? Yeah, and I, I imagine your, your wife would come with you? Yeah, of course. I mean, we both will be together. I mean, whatever I do, uh, you, uh, we are there in it together. So That's great. She's my that- biggest support. Good. I mean, it's great that you guys can both like make that work. That you know that it's not like one of you has to be somewhere for a job because I'm sure that would that would make it a lot harder to just be uh, globe trotting all the time. Yeah, uh, I think I played tournaments before marriage, and uh, uh, one month was the maximum period I could stay away without be- being homesick. But after marriage, since we have been traveling together, it, it seems like wherever we go uh, is is a uh, like a home because. She's always with me, so, so that's really nice. If you guys have kids, then things will get really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's something that we should plan. But uh, right now, because we don't have kids, I think, uh, again, this nomadic lifestyle makes all the more sense. Nice, yeah, and the chess world is, is better off because of it. Um, so, so Sagar, let's zoom out a little bit. I mean, uh, this has been awesome insight into chess in India and, and the perspective I've wanted to get for a long time. But, of course, you also have your, uh, your finger on the pulse of global chess. So uh, what, is, um, what, what are you most eager to see unfold in the next you know, year or so in terms of uh, global uh, top-level chess? Huh. I mean, in terms of uh, some players coming up, I would say uh, I'm, I'm looking forward definitely to uh, the next candidates for sure uh, as to who would challenge uh, Carlson again. Uh, <clears throat> I, I have a feeling that uh, uh, Wesley so reaching there for the world championship match would be very interesting especially because uh, he's, he's so good uh, in general I, I I would say that uh, any match that happens with a youngster like uh, what happened with Karyakin would be very interesting in, in terms of chess uh, also I would say that uh, Anand uh, 
reaching back to the top uh, is something which uh, no one really believes in uh, and uh, well if this happens uh, let's say in the next cycle uh, this could be really interesting for chess I, although i would say it's really difficult to happen but if there's someone who could do it it is anand so uh, this is something that as an indian fan i i really look forward to um, yeah i mean uh, somehow i would say my my entire thinking uh, is is lot in terms of how uh, indian players would do in the next few years so i'm i'm very uh, interested in seeing first of all vidit gujarati uh, who is 2700 yeah he's 2020. been he's been doing amazing lately yes he, he is uh, from this small town of nasik which is like uh, 200 kilometers from where i live very close by uh, and uh, he he's just going from strength to strength in fact i spoke to him just uh, yesterday and uh, i i asked him about uh, how he's feeling now and he said the isle of man kind of changed his entire perspective towards the game of chess he suddenly started to believe that uh, he can become the world champion because uh, he he drew with uh, magnus really i mean easily putting him under so much pressure with the black pieces so uh, yeah i would be very keen on seeing how he does and uh, just give it uh, two or three years and then see these young kids like uh, pragnananda and nihal uh, <laughs> reaching the top heights and giving these top guys a scare yeah that's yeah. fun yeah it'll be interesting for sure and if i could put you on the spot i know that you're friends with a lot of these guys so i'll understand if you don't want to answer but if you were to just pick who who would be the next world champion okay. from india and you could only name one person uh would you be willing to do so <laughs> yeah i i i would uh, i always like to do these uh, interesting things uh, because uh, if it if it's wrong i mean uh, it's fine because it has there are so many possibilities it would be wrong but if i'm right then you would be i would be quoted everywhere yeah so yes exactly <laughs> <laughs> so no i i i think uh, pragnananda i i definitely feel uh, has has the biggest and the brightest chance uh, i think nihal sarin is extremely talented uh, and uh, he he also can uh, have a good but i i i somehow have this uh, i've studied pragnananda's games and i feel that this guy is uh, for for example he played isle of man and he's playing against david howell or grandelius nils all these players who are 2650 and about nearly 2700 and he's just outplaying them uh, at at this age he's uh, 11 years and sorry he's now 12 12 years and 1 month old and um, i i think he has the biggest chance and in uh, with it i i see a, a really solid player uh, who's upcoming 23 year old uh, who's 27 21 Uh, whether he would be the world champion or not uh, I, i'm not sure about it but uh, yeah we'll have to uh, see about this but, but pragnananda I, i have the biggest hopes yeah that makes sense i i read a recent interview with kasparov where he said you know when you look at the person who will ultimately um unseat magnus you have to look at the the young guys um you know the the people exactly. magnus's age of course they have a chance uh but he's got a bit of a psychological advantage because he's been uh so yes. because he's been on top for so long. Sure, yeah, I, I agree with you on that. Um <laughs> Okay, so another guest question for you and this is um uh tangentially related. Um uh from Peter Newhall, he says uh Sagar seems like he really likes the interviews and not just trying to do his job and that made me curious. Who's your favorite player that you've talked to so far in 2017? Okay, I have to remember first of all uh, all the people uh, whom I have interviewed. But uh, yeah, Ding Liren, I I liked very much. Very down to earth and uh, uh, very nice to talk to. Even after losing, he would he would be ready to speak. Um, I also sp- spoke with Kramnik, and and he was uh, very nice. But I think in general, uh, usually chess players. uh interviewing them revolves a lot around how they have fared uh in the in the tournament and what has happened before the game or after the game. Uh, i mean w- what happened in the 
the previous round so i think this uh, actually decides uh, a lot of the things so in that respect i have extra respect for all these uh, people who after losing are somehow able to to speak um, nicely uh, with me uh, so in that sense i think anand uh, this year when when he got knocked out of the world cup he did speak and and this was very nice uh, but also i would say pavel eliano uh, he was waiting in the lobby uh, because he got knocked out in the first round and if you remember he was the star of 2015 world cup reaching the semi finals and here he was already knocked out in the first round so he was waiting in the lobby and i went up to him to ask uh, can you Uh, can we do a small interview and he was like of course we can and he came and i asked him some really tough questions like uh, uh, you know what do you think went wrong and uh, uh, do you some some things which uh, i would say some people would uh, have really got angry about it but but he replied them with great uh, calmness and uh, this, that's why i think that was very nice that's great to hear it's it's so important for the top players to sort of move chess away from uh the image of you know the the unstable <laughs> the 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 unstable grandmaster you know which uh is a reputation that of course is partially deserved historically but uh it's it's great that it's moving in the right direction yes yeah i, I i'm not sh- uh, sure if it's moving entirely that way because uh when you lose uh it's so difficult to speak uh, because uh, there has been such a huge uh, effect on your ment- at the mental level uh in, in chess that uh, most often i i never get a chance to to speak with the guys who have lost uh, but uh, it it usually happens on the next day uh whenever someone loses Uh, so i wouldn't say that it's like other sports where the loser just immediately has to talk and he does that gracefully uh, in chess this is still has this still has to change i think uh, this is very important yeah yeah it, it could still improve for sure also i think chess is just it's a yeah it's a different nature than to compare it to physical sports because um, yes um because it's i don't know it's hard to put into words why but but you you get what i'm saying yeah it's it's completely different but also at the same time uh, i think it's uh, important if if players can sp- speak uh, about uh, about the game i mean it's not like uh, mm, i mean you also have been a chess player i also have been and and for us uh, each game at at uh, our level is also equally important so uh, i i feel that uh, even after losing the players should be uh, there uh, to just give their uh, opinion not like uh, do a long interview or something like this but at least uh, speak a little bit to the media if you really want to to make chess uh, popular yeah so yeah i agree okay um sagar i only have a couple more topics for you if you don't mind yes. um do you do you have any recommendations for guests of like uh chess education material um whether books or uh certain videos online that resonated with you how how would you uh how would you recommend to help people improve their chess well i think this is uh, one of my favorite questions because uh i i ask this question to each and almost everyone who who i interview but i i have my own list uh, i absolutely love jeremy silman mm-hmm. uh, i don't know if you if you have read his books yes uh you you have yes yeah i'm a fan as well uh, i think the way he he explains stuff is just is tremendous uh, i learned a lot from his book uh, reassess your chess i think uh, i am not very sure the fourth edition i glanced through it uh, it was not uh, what i liked yeah third edition i love very much so so somehow uh, That's I, I like uh, that's deep in the wood, in the weeds that you're able to compare the different editions. That's impressive. No, because I read the third edition so many times. Uh, <clears throat> let's just say I I never had a coach uh, uh, to teach me uh, until I reached twenty three fifty. So I I reached there almost on my own, and I would uh, give a huge credit of that to Silman because he taught me how to think uh, in a normal position. 
uh, let's say you take a position and how exactly do you think and then he has this list of imbalances where where you say about different factors like pawn structure piece activity and suddenly um, i started to to do that in every game of mine at first it was uh, really painful because you know you have this huge list but as uh, uh, it's written in this book uh, of Josh Witzkin the art of learning yes uh, that in order to learn something you should unlearn it and and this actually started happening with me that uh, i used it so much that i no longer uh, needed to uh, remember it it became it went at the subconscious level so uh, if i am given a position now i would not use the imbalance list of silman but it's just there in my mind that I, if uh, the opponent is not well developed i should open up the position quickly so in that respect i would say uh, uh, reassess your chess and the second one is amateur's mind because in that uh, all sorts of questions are asked by these lower rated players like 1600 and 1800 and and uh, how they are thinking and uh, what mistakes they make and i could uh, relate them to my level of play when i was at that level so i would say silman definitely and uh, another person who has made a huge impact on me is daniel king uh, because uh, for me silman came first uh, i think and then say let's say when i was nearing the end of silman i started picking up daniel king's dvds power play series i think it's tremendous from power play 1 if you start watching them till 25 okay uh, once he started making dvds which were related to openings i i'm not very sure if that is as useful as the ones which are general ones like the pawn structure ones uh, especially the fifth uh, power play dvd i i i just love it uh, and i watched it so many times uh, the the scene would be something like i sit in a room with a uh, small dim light uh, with uh, uh, daniel speaking on uh, on my laptop and the moment he says pause your dvd i would do that instantly and i have a chess board uh, by the side of the laptop and then i would think on the board write down my answer on a, on a book uh, which is there next to it and then i would start the video again it was like uh, just a personal training from this guy from from uh, such a great grandmaster and i learned so much so i think it all depends on how enthusiastically you pick up things uh, because the great, there is great material everywhere uh, but if you are not ready to learn well what what can you get from even great material Okay. Well, that's awesome advice. And we've had several guests have recommended Jeremy Soman. Obviously, he's a sort of uh, legendary chess author. Uh, and Daniel yes. King, I know he has quite a YouTube following, but you're the first person to recommend his his DVDs. So I'll be sure to, to link to them, and, um, and I'll definitely want to check them out myself now. I think uh, his YouTube uh, videos are more uh, like uh, current stuff. and uh, personally i would say it's very good to stay updated with latest games but if you really want to see an improvement in your level of play then it's much more important to have a structured uh, uh, learning and that happens through his dvds okay that's good to know okay so sagar the last sort of topic i want to talk about is uh, this has been an awesome talk i mean you you are uh, you know you're so steeped in chess i mean obviously all of our guests chess is a big part of their life but you you've got so many angles because you still play uh you you're very good at presenting the material and teaching people what you know and you also uh get to cover all of these elite players but i i i also i always like to find out a little bit more about the the person so what is your life like when you're home with your wife in mumbai what else what what hobbies do you guys have what do you guys do for um not chess related <laughs> I yeah, actually I I I wish I had a long answer to this but uh, the the thing is we are so much into chess uh, that we hardly have a life outside it uh, we have been planning and it's almost 3 and 1/2 years since uh, Amrutha and I got married we have been planning to take uh, days off uh, every week let's say one day off a week like every normal couple would do uh, but at the end of it we always end up either uh working on chess either doing some report or either uh, 
either practicing chess or maybe teaching chess to someone so so our life outside chess is very minimal but <laughs> whenever we get time uh, we like to watch movies uh, on laptop we uh, so we we plan always that we'll go out and see city or, or something but we prefer staying in uh, and watching a movie or some serial you know uh, these uh, us uh, ser- we, we series uh, we we like a lot uh, like big bang theory or um, let's say game of thrones and and we look forward to this uh, uh, these things uh, also I, I we like to explore uh, places whenever we go somewhere uh, for example recently we were in in poland in warsaw and we were with uh, another indian gm uh, sandeepan and we went into the city and we walked uh, quite a lot and in 3 hours we we walked through the city and uh, uh, saw a lot of things and at the end Sandeepan said uh, you know if, if it were, wasn't for you guys I would have never seen so much of the city so uh, I feel that we both have kind of become uh, very good at uh, uh, going into a new place and exploring it this is one of the things that we like uh, not doing it uh, for too many days but uh, let's say we choose a few hours and then uh, see that very uh, very nicely and uh, so this is one of our things that we like nice yeah i like to see cities that way too just walk around um yes yes get a yes, sense yes, of uh, the pulse of life um okay so uh related question uh, we've managed to make it this far and haven't even uh talked about the fact that you're a chartered accountant so are, so do you still do any uh accounting work right now or is it on the back burner well i i, I take my chartered accountants i mean uh, i remember i became a ca in 2012 in january and i was uh, attending a wedding at that point uh in in a very nice uh, indian um, place called goa uh, and i was on at the beach and i got to know that i cleared so i i just sat down at the beach closed my eyes it was a very uh, nice feeling because it's supposed to be a tough examination and i cleared it at the first attempt by the way uh, chess helped me tremendously because i could sit for long hours and study without uh, uh, much difficulties uh, because of chess and then at that point when i was sitting at the beach i i decided that uh, i need the next one year to pursue chess completely without doing anything related to uh, CA, uh, Chartered Accountancy. And uh, that's when I actually gained, uh, I think, 100 ELO points from 2250 to 2350. And uh, after that, I think uh, I, I never looked back. Uh, so right now, my CA uh, degree that I have is, is useful for two things. Uh, one is that people can't fool me very easily because uh, I know a few things related to accountancy, tax and stuff. Uh, so so it's useful when uh, we're doing work related to Chess Base India. And the other thing is that it's uh, useful to advise youngsters who are always uh, thinking about to choose either Chess or education. And, and I, I tell them that actually you can do both. That's great, yeah, and I think that's, yeah, it's good to have multiple options. I mean, you know, we've had guests who went the only chess route and guests who, you know, are kind of the whole way out of chess and everywhere in between, and I think it's can't hurt to have mo- to have lots of choices. Yes, for sure, and, but this also comes with its own drawback. For example, uh, right now, if you look at me, I would be an IM uh, with two GM norms. Of course, I want to become a GM. Uh, I am a reporter. Uh, I would say I I really like reporting. Uh, recently, uh, a lot of people loved my reporting. But I also have a company uh, in India, so I'm an entrepreneur. So I have to devote time to it. So so it's always uh, uh, you know you're putting your bas- uh, eggs in different basket. It it reduces the risk, but also it's uh, you're always short of time for for uh, different things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, understandable. Well, Sagar, you're you're providing a tremendous service to the to the chess community. So, uh, you you know, I'm sure there's some sacrifice on your end, but but uh, you've got a lot of fans who appreciate what you're doing. 
thank you so much for this and uh, i well i hope to continue doing this way and uh, our, our one year trip which is uh, due very soon uh, of a nomadic life should take this to the next level like Ex- excellent well we'll be watching for that and i think most people know to go to chess space india to find you but if they want to reach out to you personally is there a way that our listeners can do that yeah of course you can contact me on facebook i i always uh, even check my other inbox which uh, uh, which uh, gets messages when you don't have any mutual friends so i reply to that as well uh, and the other way is to, to my email address uh, which uh, is uh, sagarchess1 at yahoo.co.in uh, i think in general uh, i get a lot of mails and um, i have a lot of things to do but whenever i get time i try to respond back if there is some query about uh, something specific related to chess i mean if in general people ask questions like how to improve or something it's too huge a topic to re- uh, reply back but if it's something specific about something which is required uh, then i i usually reply okay uh, excellent well thank you so much this was really interesting um and and we definitely look forward to to following you in the future yes thank you so much and uh, ben i have I have a question for you as well uh, i mean uh, what what inspired you to start this uh, channel uh, like uh, these audio interviews um so this is something i've talked about here and there but basically uh i mean i, I had multiple reasons number one is uh podca- podcasts are a sort of growing medium and one that i'm a, a big fan of so i i listen to them a lot as a as a chess teacher um here here where i am i do a lot of school programs and stuff so i'm in the car driving around a lot and i can't really watch youtube videos when i'm driving around so i wanted there to be audio only chess content and i knew that i wouldn't be the only one who wanted that so that's sort of one pillar and the other pillar is just i didn't really feel like i knew the personalities of the chess players that much and i felt like this this uh medium could was the right um way for us to for chess fans to get to know the people behind the moves, basically. So that was my motivation. I I I, I think this is really a great idea because there are many videos and there is a lot of written content, but uh, not much uh, at the audio level. So yeah, this is great. I mean, I would say this this is one of the very few chess podcasts available online yes yes exactly uh, maybe the on- only one yeah well the full english nice. breakfast uh, they they are amazing and hopefully they'll uh, get back on schedule um mm-hmm. but yeah they're they're uh, in and out at the moment and other than that it's just me as far as i know oh, wonderful yeah by the way i have this uh, very interesting concept called uh, jogging uh, which is called chess plus jogging uh in which you take a position and you start running uh and you, in your head uh and uh, you you are running until you can solve that position blindfold oh uh, man and uh maybe it's uh, with your podcast people can do something like pogging which is like listening to it and and running to yeah there <laughs> so, i would say there is a a small subset of people with a strong desire for something like that <laughs> uh, okay. I, I don't i don't think it would reach a ton of people but there definitely are people and i i have some friends who would would love trading methods like that and even i would love i would definitely love something like that so if you ever uh I know you're a busy guy, but if you ever um, come up with some material, um, we can we can talk offline about how to how to get it into the world. Yes, for sure. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Sagar. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, same here, and thanks for having me. Thanks to everyone who supports Perpetual Chess. I spend about five hours a week on each episode, and even though I love doing it, it can be hard to find the time. Donations from listeners make a huge difference and make Perpetual Chess a lot more sustainable. Special shout out to my Patreon Perpetual partners. They are Johnny McMenamin, Todd Bryant, Greg Shahadi, Jen Scream, Timothy Ha, Tatia Vabramahan, Paul Sweeney, Jennifer Shahadi, Pascal Charbonneau, Zhao Cheng, Kelly Palmer, Matthew Tedesco, Gary Andrews, Krishna Galapakrishnan, Ricky Grahava, Chris Flanagan, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Rob Lazorchek, Jennifer Valens, Tim Seymour, and Chris Wainscott. Thanks a lot, everyone. I'll catch you guys next week with another episode.